Zachary Levi, welcome to Sports Spectrum. It's great to talk to you. How are you doing? I'm really well, thank you. How are you today? I'm doing well. It's great to have you here. Let's start with sports because that's what we're about here. Sports and faith, obviously, on mm -hmm. Sports Spectrum. And we have a mutual friend, Andy Irwin, who helped direct and uh, produce your movie, American Underdog. He and yeah. I were talking about this interview. I shot him a text and said, hey, I'm talking to Zachary Levi. What should I know? And he said, you have to ask him about the Dodgers and you have to ask him about his love for off-road ATV sports. <laughs> so here's the question, Zach. <laughs> What do you oh, think? Well, okay. Oh, well, the Dodgers are, I mean, they're my boys in blue. I mean, I grew up in Southern California. So yeah. uh, Dodgers, Lakers, uh, I mean, you know, Kings, Ducks, Angels, Clippers. I mean, really I, everybody, but Dodgers, Lakers are really, really all my guys. And, um, you know, the, uh, what was it? 80, 88 series, I think was it, you know, Hershiser, <laughs> Gibson. I mean, you know, that, that was kind of the beginning of my love and, it was a long time coming to finally get that one, <laughs> that one we got uh, recently. But um, man, I just, I, I think baseball is just a, a, you know, it's America's pastime. It's always been America's pastime. Uh, but I have a lot of love for the Dodgers and I've been to many games and I've gotten to throw out a first pitch and I've got to sing the national anthem. And, you know, so a lot, lots of rich history with those, with that organization. Um, and then off-road vehicles. Well, listen, he's, he's, he's telling you to ask about that because I don't know if he told you, but he came to my ranch um, and I have this, um, you know, like a like doom buggy, basically. I mean, it's a, a side-by-side. It's a, a Honda Talon uh, two-seater that's all souped up and real fun. And typically it's, it's how I initiate people into their first trip at the ranch. And uh, Andy may have soiled his pants. I don't know that for a fact, uh, but I... <laughs> He he said he had a good time, but I think he was also terrified. So yes, uh, that's, I'd probably be terrified too. It sounds like it's. A, it's oh no, you were you'd be in good hands. I've I haven't tipped that thing once. Out of boy, well that sounds good to me. I yeah. did want to ask you because it's sports, right? Your connection and obviously Andy Irwin was one of the directors on uh, your role American as, Underdog. on American yeah. Underdog in your role as Kurt Warner. Now that that movie's done and out, and everybody's kind of seen it. What are your thoughts when you think back about playing that role and what that experience was like for you? Oh man, it was such a, an honor. I mean, I, I, I love that I got, well, it was really God. I mean, you know, like I wasn't even available for it originally that I was pre pandemic. I was off doing a bunch of other movies and they were, you know, spooling up uh, American underdog to happen. And then the pandemic happened and everything shut down and then everything shuffled. And then all of a sudden I was available to do the movie because it started spooling up faster than some of the other things I was going to do. Hmm. And John and Andy, I had known previously prior to that a bit, and they always kind of had an idea of maybe, you know, what if Zach had played this role and now I was available and then they came to me and look, I mean, I was a Kurt Warner fan since I saw all this, all that going down in real time when I was 19 or so, whenever, whenever that was. And yeah, um, I was always a big fan of his, not just the amazing, incredible, miraculous Cinderella story that we got to watch happen in front of us, but that he was a man of faith and that he was a good guy and like, you know, loved his wife and loved the kids. And, and I, you know, once I signed on for the movie, then I got to spend time with him and Brenda and they are exactly who you want them to be. They're just wonderful people. And, um, and I was really honored that I got to play a really good guy and, and, you know, tell that story to some people who, you know, a lot of people already knew it, but they were still moved by the movie, which was great. And then a lot of people never knew the story and they were even more, even more kind of um, taken with it. And, you know, we did pretty good. I mean, we're a small movie compared to a lot of the other things that we were opening up around like Spider-Man and stuff like that, you know, and, um, <laughs> but, but like with movies, a lot of movies nowadays, it's in those second markets. It's like, you know, I can't tell you how many people I get texts from that are on a plane and they're like watching you, watching, you know, watching the movie on the plane now. And then the, and then, you know, surely, sure enough, a couple hours later, I'll get, I cried. Why'd you make me cry? Um, and I'm like, you're welcome. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. So uh, it's, it was a really cool project and I'm really grateful that we got to do it. And I, and I'm really proud of it. I think we made a great little movie. Yeah, it was a great movie. Kurt's been on this show and we've known Kurt for many years now and obviously a man of faith. Your faith's really important. You talk a lot about your faith in your new book, Radical Love. We're going to talk about the book in a second. Let me just ask you about that faith. Maybe it's importance from a, a general term, it's importance in your life right now. Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, our spiritual 
philosophical uh, underpinnings are kind of everything in life. You know, I mean, I all of my opinions, all of my thoughts, all of which are therefore you know all of my actions they're all still on a bedrock of what do i believe ultimately deep down what do i do do you believe that there's a god or not if you do believe there's a god what is the nature of that god what does that god intend for this world for your life for the lives of others how can you then therefore fit into that plan and allow your and you know uh uh open yourself to be available to be used in whatever that plan is i ever since i was a very small child i grew up in a christian-ish home i mean you know Christian is a very wide swath of definition, yeah. particularly now. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, my mom, my mom, my dad, my mom and dad divorced when I was young. My dad, and I grew up with my mom. My dad was a bit more religious and liturgic and, you know, church every Sunday, taught Bible or, you know, would teach Sunday school to kids, still does. I mean, well, he doesn't really, the pandemic changed a lot of things. But anyway, point is singing in the worship team, going to church multiple times a week. I mean, he was very much that, that yeah. guy. My mom, on the other hand, was very anti-establishment, anti-authority, deeply spiritual speaking in tongues you know would have people over and you know really get deep into all that stuff and so i was raised around a lot of that and had a i think a very uh interesting and deep appreciation for a lot of that stuff early on but i got to 18 and i was like you know i don't know that i believe any of this because i believe it i I know i believe it because my parents do but i don't want to just believe something because my parents believe it so i then journeyed really you know starting after high school i really just started journeying to have a deeper understanding of what my walk with God uh, is and and who God is and uh, the nature of God and and what is my relation to all of that and who who did God create me to be and that's been a never ending as it will you know never is, is this never ending uh, uh, amazing ride with twists and turns and ups and downs and you know just trying to um, uh, you know become I, I you know my prayer every morning is help me to be the man that you've created me to be. I, I don't want to be anything other than that. And I fail at it all the time, all the time, as we all do. Um, but uh, I really do. Ever since I was four, I've always uh, believed, w- with the exception of when I really lost my faith in, in, you know, in, in the book. And, I'll, and we'll talk about that. But, you know, ever since I was four, I, I, I knew that there was a God and I knew that God loved me. And I knew that I wanted to go and love people and be a, a you know, um, a conduit of that love of God's. And I think that was always kind of imprinted on my heart. I love people uh, genuinely. I, I it, it breaks my heart when I see people uh, af- acting out of fear and anger and hate. And that's so much of why I, I think this book, um, why I was passionate about writing it, because I don't really care about writing a memoir about myself. I haven't lived enough life to write an autobiography or 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 anything or i you know i've done some cool stuff but not anything cool enough where it's like oh let me tell everybody about how cool my life is like i don't care about that but if i can be authentic and vulnerable and open up about some struggles that i've had and if that using my platform if that helps other people to feel more seen and heard and loved and understood and not so alone in their own mental health journeys then by god that's what i'm gonna do and uh and really help to people to understand that you know love is not just uh, amplified like. It's not just, uh, oh, you really like something, then you love it. No, that's a feeling. That's the feeling of love or being in love if it's a romanticized version of that. But, um, you know, Jesus was pretty clear about love in over and over and over again. And, you know, one of the things that I, it still boggles my mind that it doesn't boggle my mind that the secular world doesn't adhere to it. But when I see people who do kind of subscribe to Christianity, not uh, going along with this scripture, it it bums me out, which is, you know, to love your enemy and pray for your persecutor. I just don't see that happening a lot. And I, and I, and again, you know, the followers of Jesus should be the ones that are exemplifying what that is and hopefully bringing people who don't understand that message, showing them the power of what that means. Um, and, you know, and love doesn't mean, also, it doesn't mean just dropping every boundary and allowing somebody to just do whatever they want to. It doesn't mean, you know, to forgive somebody doesn't mean to forget either. To forgive somebody doesn't mean, all right, well, I forgive you and now you can hurt me again. No, you can forgive and you can love and you can actually still not like that person. And that's okay. You can forgive and you can love and still have plenty of boundaries between you and the unhealthy behaviors of these other people. That is not just okay. That's good. We are meant to do that. Jesus wasn't saying like, go love and, you know, like turn the other cheek and all that stuff. One can might, 
you could interpret or misinterpret in my opinion that that means just be you know be a doormat and be walked all over no that's not what it is it's it's having the for the fortitude in yourself first of all it starts with loving yourself that that's one of the biggest things i learned i didn't up until 37 years old i didn't know that i didn't love myself mm. and that's sad it broke my heart when i figured that out but i never learned it I mean, how could you possibly know how to love yourself if your parents didn't exemplify that or really love you in all the healthiest of possible ways? And so it made sense once I broke all that down. But, you know, to, to love ourselves firmly and, and truly and to accept that we are these miracles that we're walking around, even if you don't believe in God, you're a miracle. You're still this life force that is mir- life is a miracle. I don't, every blade of grass, every puppy, every cat, every falcon, every whatever, every human, we're all these miracles walking around on this ball of mud, spinning around in the middle of the universe. And we still, despite all of our efforts to find life somewhere else in the galaxy or the universe or anywhere else, we still haven't been able to find it. Now, granted, we're limited in our capacities and there's still vast uh, amounts of space that we haven't touched yet, but we've seen a lot. Yeah. These, these, these people, these scientists are looking all over the place and they can't find anything. So even up to the point that we're at right now, we're still a mathematical miracle, even if you don't believe in a God. So let's start treating ourselves and each other like the miracles that we are. And yes, some people, they, they come into this world and they are, they are, as children, they are, we're all products of our environment at the end of the day. And yep. if we can see that, if we can see the five-year-old child in every single person, our, our enemies and our persecutors, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to go, okay, you know what? I radically accept that you are where you are in your life. I don't agree with it. I don't condone it. I think what you're doing might be very wrong. You might even be evil, but I am not going to dehumanize you. I'm not going to vilify you. I'm not going to call you a monster. I'm not going to attack you with shame, which is the opposite of everything Jesus stood for. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to radically accept that you are a product of your environment, and I'm going to radically forgive you, not forget, not allow you to hurt me anymore, but I will forgive you because I, I go, oh, wow, you're operating not because you want to do this, but because this is the way you were brought up in the world, and I'm going to radically love you. Still have boundaries. Still, by the way, there's consequences to our actions. We can still hold people accountable. There is still accountability and responsibility, but to hold people to the bad decisions that they make and some and this is really rampant now and you know look cancel culture and all of the things we just go oh you did that bad thing by the way and it's not even like a current thing it might have been a bad thing somebody did 12 years ago or right. something they said or whatever and we go off with their head they don't deserve to be alive anymore this horrible sh- and everyone's just shaming and shaming and shaming and it's it breaks my heart man because that is not the heart of god at all not in my opinion I don't think in the opinion, opinions of a lot of other people either, you know, that, and that is radical love. Je- Jesus, you know, you could say that, you know, you know, uh, and people do, they say, well, he was, he was killed because he was ultimately saying that he was God and that he was the son of God. And, you know, maybe that played into it, but to be perfectly honest, I think he was killed because he was really, di- you know, deconstructing all that Judaism was at the time and all of these rules and regulations and things that he's like, no, 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 you, you don't understand. But all of that was supposed to bring us to an understanding that none is righteous, not one, and that we are all in need of this love and this grace and this forgiveness. And yet we don't practice it as a society. And it is a bummer. So that's what's so, I know I could talk for days about it, but <laughs> you need to go preach a sermon at a church somewhere. Amen and hallelujah, baby. Let's go. That's really good. No, honestly, Zach, when I think about it, it reminds me of the scripture uh, you know, which is love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbor and not yourself. And so the idea of learning to accept yourself and yeah. others, I mean, that's the words of Jesus in this new book, Radical Love. Tell me more about this book and why you wanted to write it. You even said it, you know, you haven't lived enough years to write a, you know, a full on memoir here, but yeah. I read this book and it is an important book, my friend. I mean, it's, it's as vulnerable and transparent of a book as I've read. And I know it's going to help a lot of people. Thank you, man. I, I I appreciate that. I mean, you know, uh, it it'll be interesting to see what the reception is ultimately at the end of the day. But I I feel good about it. I feel like uh, I've been trusting God through the process, and you know, I'm gonna let the chips fall where they may. Um, but I, I never intended to write a book. Mm. I I I I went through my journey, 
And that journey, particularly after, you know, through this incredible life-changing, life-saving therapy, I ended up booking Shazam. And so when I was promoting that movie, I felt it was my obligation to tell people, hey, listen, yes, I got this job, but it was only because I first went and did this very important work and a work that continues, by the way, it's not fixed. I'm healing. It's a journey. It continues to go, but yeah. I, I initiated it. And that's one of the kind of, one of the, I think one of the coolest things about God is you don't have to get all the way there before God starts unlocking blessings and opportunities for you, but you do need to start going after what is right. You have to at least initiate that. If you're sitting, you know, like God can't park, a, or God can't uh, steer a parked car, like that kind of a situation, right? But yeah. God's not waiting for you to be perfect, but he's waiting for you to engage in, in your healing, in doing right by yourself and by others. And, um, so anyway, so I got, so I, I get Jazam and then I'm talking about how all of that happened on the press tour of it. And I did some, some podcasts and Harper Collins, who's my publisher, they, they saw those and they said, Hey, we think there's a book here. And, you know, I'd have been approached before to write something before, but I had nothing to talk about. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Just because I'm a celebrity doesn't mean I have anything to say. And then when this happened, I go, okay, actually, you know what? I could talk about that because once I went through the process, I mean, I can't stop talking about mental health, man. It, I really think it's the most important thing we all need to be talking about. I think that every other problem in the world, every single one, yeah. murder, rape, theft, war, uh, environment, w every issue we have across the aisle of faith and, and, and religion and politics and philosophy, every single bit of the greed at the top of industry that is leading to so much uh, 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 you know, um, m money inequality, all of the, the, the poverty of people that need all these, stuff, all of that greed, all of it is rooted in some broken heart or broken mind, all of the, all of the anger, all of the fear, all of the things, the ways that we don't take care of ourselves and each other, it's all rooted in some broken part of our psyche. And yeah. so I, you know, you, you, you track it back down to the source, go to the source, go back up river, up river is all of these broken hearts and minds fix all the broken hearts and minds. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, all these other things start to, you know, start to get a little better. So I was like, yeah, okay, I can try and, and write that book. And, uh, and that's ultimately what was that, you know, that was the impetus for it. And then, you know, trying to unpack it all was interesting, because I wasn't really sure. Like, you know, well, what is the message? Ultimately, what am I trying to tell people? And I, I, I really do think that at the end of the day, it's got to be this. It's We have got to come to the place of understanding these same things that Jesus was shouting from the rooftops, man. I mean, it's it, it, yeah. it doesn't, truth and wisdom, real universal truth and wisdom doesn't change. It's with us uh, all the time. And this is a universal truth and wisdom. We can either continue to be these animalistic versions of ourselves that are all afraid, these tribal versions of ourselves that just oh, those people, because they're different in this way or that way or whatever, we all have these animosities or we can recognize, oh, okay, hey, hang on, we might not agree. And I, in fact, some of those things you're doing, we got to put an end to, or I think we need to, but let's sit down at the table and humanize each other again. And, yes. or maybe for the first time, I don't know, and just lead with love, you know, lead with love. And, 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 when you experience hate from someone, take the time. And again, this, this requires us working on ourselves first. If you work on yourself first, then when somebody is uh, uh, hateful to you, you recognize that it's not a personal thing. It's a reflection of who they are, right? This right. is part of the problem. We don't work on ourselves enough. And so somebody does something and we get triggered and we're like, oh, they're a horrible person or whatever. But if we do the work on ourselves, we go, okay, oh, no, no, that's, that's coming from them. And then we can see the hurt behind the hate. But if we don't do that work, we don't see the hurt behind the hate. All we see is the hate. And we don't recognize that they're just a scared, hurt person on the other side of that. Yeah, and it's powerful. Yeah. So the new book, again, Radical Love, Learning to Accept Yourself and Others, releases June 28th, 2022. Excited for it, Zach. My last question, because we only got a couple minutes left here. Uh, in the season of life that you're in right now, I love asking this question to all of our guests. Lots of exciting projects coming up. Obviously, the book, uh, the new Shazam movie, Fury of the Gods sequel coming out at Christmas time later this year. What is God teaching you and showing you in this season of life that you're in right now? What's he showing you? Oh, man, you know, uh, a lot of the same stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I wrote this book. I wrote the book. Uh, most of it was written before the pandemic and was pretty much done. I mean, I, I talk about it in the book. I, you yeah. know, I was like, okay, cool. Like went to therapy, did the deal, got healed. I'm good. I was fixed. So I thought, but I wasn't. 
because it's a journey. It's a lifetime. It's, it's not a, it's a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's that kind of stuff. And uh, so, you know, then augmenting the book and recognizing that that is, and then putting all that, you know, incorporating all that, it's kind of, in some ways, I really love that I'm not, you know, when to talk about the book or when I talk to people about the book, it's not me saying, look at what I've done. I can help you do what I did. Some, yeah. some of it is that, but it's a lot of it is just saying, hey, I'm still struggling with the same stuff you're struggling with, but here's some tools that I've learned that I'm applying right now in real time. And so a lot of that, like right now in this season, man, self-love is still the biggest lesson that God is trying to teach me. It's still the biggest thing that I'm trying to absorb and feel and so much of that as i've come to find out you know like uh like making food for myself it, it, this might sound ridiculous but <laughs> like my my whole life my mom cooked a little bit but she didn't really cook that much we had a lot of like frozen burritos and stuff when we were growing up and then i, I became a, an adult and i was working and i was making enough money to go eat cheap you know fast food and then i got into hollywood and i was making good money and then i was able to eat at nice restaurants and also like uh, pay for meal delivery or whatever it was. I have always been able to insulate myself from actually taking care of myself in certain basic ways. And by the way, this is actually something I think is a huge thing, particularly nowadays. So many kids nowadays, particularly, have no idea what it means to balance their checkbook, to make food for themselves, to self-care. It's all self-care. And all of those little things are actually very paramount in understanding how to value your vessel. When you can make food for yourself, you feel an accomplishment. It's why people tell you, make your bed in the morning. It's not so you have a tidier room. It's because you get your first hit of dopamine just by straightening your, your, your bed. That's right. And right. that, and it becomes a, you know, kind of a snowball effect. You get a little more and you get a little more. You get up, you go to go brush your teeth. Oh, okay, there you go. You, you go wash yourself. You go put some clothes on. You go do some tasks. You go make some breakfast. All of those things are investing in you. And so this is a like weird, like I, I'm, I'm 40, nearly 42 years old and I'm learning how to cook for the first time. I love it. But I love it. It's great. It's important for me in my process of loving myself. And it's, I think it's important for everybody in their process. So if you don't know how to cook, go learn how to cook. Oh, my wife will uh, listen to this and think, okay, Jason, now it's time to leave <laughs> Zachary Levi here and go learn how to cook. So thanks, Zach. Appreciate that, buddy. Uh, you're welcome. Congratulations on the book, Radical Love, releasing June 28th. He is Zachary Levi. You got the new Shazam movie. We love Tangled. We love Chuck. So just love all that uh, the stuff that you've been a part of and appreciate you taking some time with us here on Sports Spectrum. Jason, thank you so much for your time and sending lots of love and light to everybody listening right now. And uh, we'll, we'll catch you on down the road to talk about more stuff.